So good morning. My name's Tom Perkins. Um, I guess I was Steve's first student uh, to graduate doing biophysics. I think the title of the symposium really gives us an overview of how diverse Steve's intellectual interests are. Uh, optical trapping for atoms, of course, has been demonstrated to be very important, and we heard a lot of wonderful talks. Um, today, in the, in the second session, what we're going to hear about is optical traps help seed the development of a new field, which is called single molecule biophysics. But at the time, in Steve's group, this is really known as DNA mumbo jumbo by the atomic physics people, because it was this whole new area of Steve's interest contained in one little lab, but very intellectually orthogonal to the ongoing work in atomic physics. Um, so we've heard a lot about Steve being intense and Steve being competitive. But Steve, Steve really likes getting feedback, positive feedback. And so we were doing some original experiments uh, in, 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 in sort of polymer physics. That, and so Dejen had an idea that polymers reptate. And so we went out to test the assumption of this. And when we were talking to one of our polymer physics colleagues, Steve goes, do you think Dejen's happy? And um, because we had proved this central assumption, and, and uh, the colleague said, well, I think Dijin's already happy. He might just be a little happier. Um, so uh, the first speaker today is going to be Carlos Bustamante, who will tell us about uh, a lot of wonderful things that you can learn when using optical traps. <clears throat> thank you, Tom. Uh, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to this symposium to uh, celebrate and honor Steve. Um, actually, I met Steve in 1989. I don't know if he remembers, but he came to Los Alamos and to visit and give a talk in Los Alamos. And he stopped in Albuquerque, where I was a professor at the time. And um, we, I, for the first time, we were very interested in my lab at that time in trying to manipulate molecules of DNA using electric fields. And we were doing videos of that type. But Steve came and showed that he could actually put um, beads at the ends of DNA, and he could then try to trap these, these beads and manipulate them physically. And really, in retrospect, um, it is amazing to me that actually this was happening in 19, late 1980s when he was heavily involved in the development of the uh, atom cooling and atomic uh, physics that we, as we've heard this morning. And already at that time, he was really interested in making and opening a new frontier in biophysics, which he did. And so um, today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about the type of biophysics. And this is more for the physicists in the audience who maybe are not so acquainted with the kind of developments that have occurred in biophysics. And so the kind of biophysics that is now possible to do, thanks to the ideas and the developments that came out of the work done by Steve and his collaborators at Bell Labs and then at Stanford in the 80s. So I'm going to tell you about a, a molecular motor. This is a molecular motor that actually sits at the base of a virus. And this virus must self-assemble. And a part of this self-assembly, it needs to actually, actually package its DNA, its genome, inside this protein, protein capsid which is essentially uh, what protects the DNA. This work has been done by uh, three very talented postdocs in the lab and three very talented graduate students, and in collaboration with people at the University of Minnesota, Dwight Anderson and Shelley Grimes. So let me uh, pose to you the issue that, in, that really initially made us interested in this system of biophysicists. And here is an electron micrograph of the capsid of this virus, P29, bacteriophage P29. And you see that it has very small dimensions, 40 nanometers by 50 nanometers, for a total volume of less than 60, that 70 millimicrons cubed. And inside this tiny little volume, in fact, the phage has to package a molecule of DNA that has about 20,000 base pairs, or that is about six and a half microns long. And this feat is actually made up, carried out, by this molecular motor. These are proteins that have evolved to be able to convert the chemical energy of ATP hydrolysis into mechanical work. And they are able to grab the DNA, this, in this case this motor, 
and essentially stuff the DNA inside the head of the bacteriophage. Now, if you do a simple calculation, you will find that the DNA at the end of the packaging inside the head ends up being compressed about 6,000 times relative to the volume that will normally occupy in solution. And for those of you who are more on the biology side in the audience, that means that at the end of the packaging, the DNA concentration inside the head of the bacteriophage is about 500 milligrams per milliliter, which are the concentrations in which you find DNA if you crystallize DNA. In fact, in a crystal of DNA, you get concentrations of this type. And so, obviously, this is a real feat, what this, this motor is doing. And opposing this packaging, there must be many forces. For example, electrostatic, DNA is highly charged. Um, bending rigidity, DNA is very, 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 very stiff as polymer. And the fact that, of course, there is also an entropy cost in trying to bring the DNA and just organize it inside the head of the bacteriophage. So, biologists have suspected for many years that, in fact, this process takes place, but that probably the DNA must be kept inside at high pressures. Let me tell you a little bit about what we know of this motor. The motor is made up of three components, one called a connector, which is a 12 uh, mer or a dodecamer, and it's a ring with an opening large enough for DNA to pass through. DNA is about 22 Armstrongs in diameter, so 35 Armstrongs is opening here at the center of this connector is enough for the, for the DNA to go through. Then there is a molecule of pRNA or packaging RNA. This is surprising because it's a, it's a five mirror, it's a, it's a pentamer of these five molecules of RNA, and we don't know really why it's necessary, but it's essential for packaging. And then there are the cylinders of the motor itself, which are the ATP aces. These are the molecules that carry out the hydrolysis of ATP release the energy and convert the energy into mechanical work and fourth generation. So we think of our engine as a five-cylinder engine, basically. Now, here is um, a view of the motor. You can see that there are essentially three concentric rings that allow the DNA to go through into the head of the bacteriophage. Now, for the biologists in the audience, I want just to remind you that um, this particular motor it belongs to a very large family, in fact, a super family of ATPases, so-called ring ATPases, that are called the ASCII family of ring ATPases, which are involved in a number of important functions in the cell. ATP synthesis, DNA repair, transport of cargo, recombination, protein transport, chromosome segregation, etc. And so there is quite a bit of interest in trying to understand how is that the hydrolysis of ATP is coordinated to the actual mechanical tasks that these motors, these all different motors, actually carry out in the cell. And, well, it has been very difficult to actually establish this, in part because this kind of mechanochemical interaction that these motors carry out, after all, these are molecules that consume ATP, carry out a chemical reaction, but that one of the products of the reaction is force, mechanical force. And so, obviously, you need methods to be able to to follow this type of fourth generation. And that's one of the things that has become possible thanks to the work of Steve, since actually soon after the development of the optical traps for atoms, it became clear also at Bell Labs that it was possible to trap dielectric objects like plastic beads and use them in order to, in fact, manipulate them. So what Steve showed me in 1989 was, in fact, the possibility of attaching these type of beads to DNA and eventually move them around. And that was, the, I, to my knowledge, the earliest uh, observation that I know of in which molecules of DNA were being, in fact, manipulated with light. So in the experiment that I'm going to tell you about now, we essentially do that. We connect a bacteriophage that has part of the DNA still to be packaged, as shown here, between two beads, one kept atop a micropipette by suction, and the other, which is kept in the optical trap, which is indicated here by the, the, the tick marks. And now that we have this situation, of course, here you can see the capsid of the bacteriophage held there on the surface of this bead by antibodies to, that, to the protein on the capsid, we can play tug of war with one single bacteriophage, right? I mean, the bacteriophage, once we add ATP, will try to start packaging and we can actually apply force and try to prevent that or follow the actual packaging in real time. And you can do two types of experiments. The first one is what we call a constant force of force feedback 
experiment where instead of as the packaging begins by the bacteriophage, of course, the tether is going to get shorter, and that will tend to increase the tension in the DNA, but the optical tap trap is measuring the tension, and you can put the system in feedback so that you tell the machine, move the pipette upward so that the whole packaging occurs at a constant preset tension value, right? And then you can actually plot the distance between the beads, which is proportional to the length of the DNA that has not been packaged yet, as a function of time. And you see here four of those traces that show that, in fact, this type of measurement is very robust. You can measure how the packaging occurs in real time into the, into the capsid. But perhaps the most interesting data that you can obtain from this constant force experiment is when you plot the rate of packaging, which is the slope of this curve, of course, as a function of the percentage of the DNA that has already entered the head of the bacteriophage. And you have that here, rate versus percentage of genome package. And you see that for up to about 50, 40 or 50 percent of the DNA can go inside the bacteriophage, and the rate of packaging is constant. But then it starts coming down, 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 and eventually it goes to zero, indicating that because the external force is constant in this experiment, the only thing that could be slowing down the motor in this case is that there is an internal force that is being generated inside the bacteriophage as the packaging occurs, which is slowing down the motor. Of course, that's the internal force that we are trying to determine. To determine that, what we need is to understand how is that the rate of packaging actually of the motor actually varies with the applied tension or force to the motor. So we do experiments where we turn off the feedback that we had here in this experiment, and now as the packaging proceeds, the motor essentially makes the bead climb the potential energy wall of the trap and therefore experiences higher and higher mechanical loads. And in that way, we can show that the rate of packaging, in fact, varies according to this curve with, in this manner, with the force, the tension that is experiencing. And because we now see, you can see that we have here rate versus force, and we have here rate versus percent of genome package, it's possible to establish a relationship between the amount of force that actually the, the motor is being that is being generated internally due to the package. First, notice that it takes a lot of force to actually stop the motor. In fact, here is a histogram, and this motor is one of the strongest motors that have been described in the literature with a stall force, a mean stall force, about 55 piconewtons uh, to stop a single, a single one of these motors. Now, you say, well, why, why do you say that's strong? I say that's strong because myosin, which is the motor in our muscles, by definition, right, it can generate only between three and five piconewtons. So this is about 20 times stronger motor than that. Now, from that kind of curve, actually, you, we determine that it's possible to determine the internal force generated through packaging. And you see that up to about 40 or 50 percent of the packaging, there is no internal force generated. But then the force goes up and climbs all the way to about 52 piconewtons. Okay? These 52 piconewtons at the end corresponds to an internal pressure of about 6 megapascals of DNA inside the bacteriophage head, okay? or about 60 atmospheres. Okay? So that was very surprising because obviously you don't think, you normally don't think that these things can be under such enormous pressure. And frankly, it, in some sense, you may think it doesn't make any sense because if we want to save ATP, all we have to do is to nature had to do is to make the head twice as big. Since, obviously, you can package 50% of the DNA without doing a lot of work, it follows that you can package 100% of it if you make the head twice as big. But we think that actually the reason these systems actually function in this way is because, in fact, the motor, has, the, the phage, has to solve another problem, a very important problem. It uses ATP from the host, by the way. It's not its own ATP. And it uses it inside this, this, the cell where it's being assembled, where there is a plenty of ATP. But then it has to go out and infect another cell as, and sit on the surface of another cell. And now it doesn't have a motor. In fact, it doesn't have ATP outside to use. And so the mechanism that it uses in order to inject the DNA is, in fact, mechanical, physical. It essentially saves the energy of ATP, the chemical energy of ATP, into mechanical potential energy in the form of a loaded spring and then 
it actually releases the loading spring in this phase in order to inject the DNA inside of the head of the bacteriophage. So this is a very interesting system, of course, and we wanted, since we had a single molecule assay to actually follow this study, uh, this packaging, then we decided we were going to do some of the other things that had become possible thanks of, to the use of optical tweezers and direct manipulation methods in biophysics, which is that you can now do single molecule kinetics, single molecule enzymology. So for example, you can do the rate of packaging as a function of the concentration of ATP, the fuel for the motor, right? And you see that we vary it here over three orders of magnitude and we get a very nice Michaelis-Menten type of behavior. In fact, we fit this data to Michaelis-Menten Hill equation where Hill is this coefficient n that is a measure of the cooperativity among the ATPases. Remember I told you there are five ATPases and what we find is that n is about one in this case and therefore suggesting that there is no cooperativity in the binding of ATP for this, by these uh, ATPases. From bulk we know that approximately one ATP is used in order to package about two base pairs but we wanted eventually to test these ideas as well. The next question that you can ask, and this is very important when you have a motor like this, is where in the mechanochemical cycle is that the actual power stroke occurs? Um, I say mechanochemical cycle because, of course, there is a reaction, a chemical reaction, which is binding ATP, hydrolyzing ATP, releasing phosphate, releasing ATP, binding another ATP, and so on and so forth. Somewhere in this chemical cycle, there must be the coupling to the mechanics, right? And so we want to know when that, where that happens. And so, again, by single molecule methods, it's possible to actually determine this because let's say, for example, that you make binding of ATP rate limiting, right? And the binding of ATP is where the actual power stroke happens. This happens often in biology. You bind the molecule of ATP and the binding energy is what really leads to a conformational change that gives the power stroke, okay, for example. So if you would make, if that were the case, and ATP is the, 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 the corresponds to the translocation step, then you could make binding very limiting, and then you would expect that the motor will become very sensitive to force, because now translocation equal to binding, very limiting, and therefore it should be very sensitive. And instead you see that the motor behaves exactly the opposite way. At high concentrations of ATP, it is very sensitive to the force. Whereas at low concentrations, where presumably binding has become rate limiting, it is very insensitive. So that clearly shows that binding of ATP cannot be the, rail, the actual power stroke step. And in fact, you can now do, see how is that velocity of the motor varies with force. You can also show how is that the KM, the so-called Michaelis Menten constant for this enzyme, vary with the Km, and in fact that the ratio of these two quantities is more or less invariant with the force. This, all this data is sufficient, together with the previous one, to show that the translocation actually coincides with the release of phosphate in the chemical cycle. So now we know that the phosphate release, when the phosphate gets released after cleavage, is that the actual power stroke occurs. So, so now let me just give you one more uh, example of what you can do with this. You may ask also, are these five cylinders, these five ATPases, independent of each other in their work, or they are coordinated in any way? And the way to answer that question is to do the following experiment. Here again is the tether length as a function of time, and what we will do is we'll repeat the experiment, but now we'll add a little bit of a molecule that looks identical almost to ATP, but cannot be hydrolyzed. Okay, and then we will ask the following question. Will the motor then stop altogether or will just continue working slower? Okay, if the ATPases are coordinated and number three has to fire before number four fires, number three bound one of these non-hydrolyzable ATPs, the whole motor is waiting until that is exchanged by a hydrolyzable one, right? On the other hand, if they are just working at random and just independent of each other, all you've done is you've converted your motor from a five-cylinder engine into a four-cylinder engine, which will work a little slower, but will still continue working. And if you add a little bit more non-hydrolyzable ATP, you will make it into a three-cylinder engine, and so on and so forth. Well, the answer is, actually, the motor, as you start adding non-hydrolyzable ATP, 
the motor starts developing these long pauses, very, very long pauses, as you see here, and they become more and more frequent the higher the concentration of non-hydrolyzable ATP, indicating, in fact, that there is a very strict coordination between the ATP ages. In fact, here is the density of the, of the pulses as a, induced by this non-hydrolyzable molecule as a function of the concentration of the non-hydrolyzable ATP, and you see that it is a linear relationship indicating that a single ATP non-hydrolyzable analog is sufficient to stall the motor and that therefore the ATP ages are not independent, but they function in succession. Before the next one can translocate, the previous one in the sequence must have completed its cycle. Another thing you can do is ask, well, what is the type of interaction between the DNA and the motor itself, right? Obviously, DNA is highly charged, and the first thing that comes to mind is that there must be some kind of electrostatic interaction between the DNA and the motor. And so the idea is to actually play a trick on the motor and give it a piece of DNA where we have eliminated the negative charge in the DNA, the phosphate. And you can do that by actually converting the phosphate in DNA through methyl phosphonate, which actually has no negative charge. And so now you can actually put 10 base pairs, as shown here, of non-charged DNA and see what happens to the motor. And the motor with 10 base pairs, well, it really shows that here is where the 10 base pairs are, and you can see that some motors pass through that part, but most of them actually tend to stop by different amount of times and eventually make it through. But a few of them also fail completely. When they get to that particular region in DNA, they stop for a while, and suddenly they release all of the DNA altogether. And you see that the percentage that passes through that chargeless region of the DNA actually decreases with the force. So, Let's put 30 base pairs of, the, of charge, chargeless DNA to see what the motor can do in this case. And what you can see is that, in fact, now the motor really can do very little. That there is, in fact, an electrostatic component between the DNA and the motor, and that by about 5 piconewtons of external force, the motor is packaging less than 1% already. So that establishes that there is an electrostatic component, but then you can ask, will any of the two chains matter in the same way? And so what you can do is you can actually get rid of the charge of only one of the chains, the five prime to three prime chain, or you can get rid of the three prime to five prime charge in the chain and ask, will the motor react in the same way in both cases? And you see here that in fact there is a big difference in the way the motor reacts. When you eliminate the charge in the five prime to three prime, the motor is much less able to package DNA and track the DNA than in the case, in the other case. So the motor, it shows this, that the motor predominantly tracks the five primes to the three prime strand. And so a model that would work, that would explain the data, would suggest that essentially the ATP ages are working in succession, right? Every time a phosphate is released, there is a power stroke and the DNA is internalized inside the head of the bacteriophage as indicated here. So it binds ATP, here is the ATP, it hydrolyzes the ATP, it releases the phosphate, and then the power stroke occurs. So we decided to test this, and for that we built a very high resolution instrument, a resolution that has essentially a one Armstrong resolution for the optical tweezers in, at room temperature. And you see here that in fact we can put a piece of DNA between two beads in two traps, and we can actually move one relative to the other, say by 3.4 Armstrong, that's the distance between two bases in DNA, and we can track very well, in fact, at different tensions, we can track very well this movement of 3.4 Armstrong. So this instrument should allow us to see what is the step size of the motor. And here, in fact, is the pairwise distribution of these curves, and you can see that we see periodicity corresponding to the 3.4 and multiples of 3.4 in the data. Okay, so... Um, So essentially, the kind of data that we expect to see with this high-resolution machine is the following, right? We will wait, the motor will wait to bind some ATP and then power stroke, bind some ATP, power stroke, bind the same power stroke, that way, right? And there are five ATP aces, so we expect five steps of probably two base pairs, of about two base pairs, actually, and that every step should be preceded by some kind of waiting time for the binding of ATP, and these waiting times, 
this dual time should be Poisson distributed because essentially that's the only thing that is happening, just the binding of ATP. So that's what we expected to see. And here is what we saw. What we saw, of course, was none of the kind, as often happens. Uh, what we see is, in fact, that the motor makes steps of this type, but notice that what we see is that there is a dual time, in fact, but then the burst is not made out of two base pairs, but 10 base pairs. This is 10 base pairs, and that was, of course, a big surprise. We vary the concentration of ATP. We still have these 10 base pairs burst uh, preceded by these dual times. In fact, here is a pairwise distribution function, 10, 20, 30, 40, etc., which indicates that we are seeing very well those burst times. And more importantly, however, the dual times are not Poisson distributed, which is what you would expect for these two ATP concentrations, according to the, to the, to the dark lines here, but they are actually peaked distributions. These peak distributions are the telltale that perhaps the motor is doing something a little bit more complicated than that. What the motor is doing is not binding ATP and firing and binding and firing and binding and firing and binding and firing, but maybe it's binding many ATPs before it actually fires. So, in other words, that there are multiple ATPs that are binding. In fact, here you can see that we have the dwell times, which are, of course, distributed with, according to these peak distributions, and you can then see how is that this distribution, this mean value here, is changing with the concentration of ATP, and you see that, in fact, it's changing a lot. At the same time, you can ask, well, what about the burst, the actual translocation? Does that vary the rate, does the, weight, the time required for translocating 10 base pairs, does it depend on the concentration of ATP? The answer is no. So that immediately tells you that all the ATP binding is occurring during these dual times, and that there is no binding occurring during the translocation, right? So now we know that, in fact, the motor is binding multiple ATPs here, and then it's translocating multiple steps during the burst time, and so, okay. So essentially, what we have now is a new packaging model. There is the dwell time with a binding phase. There is where you bind multiple ATPs, and now you have a burst time with 10 base pairs where you essentially have multiple steps, packaging steps. And in fact, the question then is how many ATPs and how many steps? Um, let me show you that I just told you that this process, the burst, is independent of ATP concentration. So how can we slow it down? We cannot lower the concentration of ATP to try to give a chance to our optical twister machine to see the sub steps. But what we can do is we can actually use force as a way to slow down the process. And so what we hope is that if we increase the force, we can actually slow it down enough that we can actually see the individual sub steps. And so that's what we've done. And here you see what happens when you bring the force from 7 piconewtons to about 40 to 50 piconewtons close to the stall force. You see that you begin to see sub steps of the motor within a 10 base pair uh, step, big step, burst. And in fact, notice that the data that we obtain, again, very surprisingly, is two and a half base pairs per ATP. Not two base pairs per ATP, but two and a half. Of course, we're going to have a hell of a time to try to publish this, because anything that is not integer in biology is a no-no. So, but it's two and a half, that's what we found. And because two times 2.5 times 4 is equal to the 10 base pairs that we see burst, now we know that there are essentially 4 ATPs. So something breaks the symmetry of the motor. Something breaks the symmetry of the motor because even though there are 5 ATPs, only 4 are being bound and being hydrolyzed. So most likely what happens is that in the previous cycle, the last ATP is still is filled with ADP. Didn't release the ADP, and so the first one, the only, there are only four open seats for the ATP to bind, and that may explain the data. So I want to, to then close, because of time, I want to be on time here, and tell you that we have now a new model of how this, of the mechanochemical cycle of this motor, in which you see that there are five of them, one of them still has ADP at the end of the cycle, and then you have the possibility of binding four ATPs, but it there is a segregated scheme here. There is a whole part of the, of the mechanochemical cycle that, that corresponds to the dual phase where all the ATPs are bound. And then there is a birth phase where all the actual power strokes actually occur and the four phase are released and the motor is reset and so on and so forth. <laughs>
So this was, of course, totally unpredictable, and it becomes possible because you have now the possibility of using not only concentrations of ATP, but force in order to actually study these kind of systems, and you have enough resolution to see the individual steps. And so here is the, 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 the idea. Instead of actually, you remember in the previous, in the previous case, I showed you one step, one step, one step. Now we have four binding ATPs followed by four steps. This is the model that we, this is the, the observation that now we made and determine that there is, in fact, a great deal of coordination among the ATP aces in the ring, and that they wait until they have all four sites filled before they actually carry out the power, the power stroke. Well, this is the first motor for which, actually, we know in great detail how one of these ring ATP aces actually work. And so uh, my students had this movie made, uh, which more or less depicts what I have told you, okay? Here is the motor. There was an ADP bound already left there, you can see. So there is only four places for the ATP to bind. The binding cocks the ATP aces, and then the hydrolysis of the phosphate and the release of the phosphate is what actually leads to the power stroke that actually makes the translocation occurs, right? So you notice that there is a coordination between the phosphate release, the ADP release on the other side, and the actual activity of the, of the, of the, of the motor. OK, so let me, um, let me just, uh, well, this is the motor of the lab. I met a man who grabbed the cat by the tail. He learned 40% more about cats than the man who did. And that's <laughs> due to Mark Twain. Um, and OK, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, so, so there's time for just a few questions. Mark, in the back. Yes, in fact, I, uh, I passed very quickly through all those slides because I was not going to have time to go through that. Um, uh, the, uh, in fact, let me pose the, uh, the, the, the issue the following way. I said that the Hill coefficient is one, and that means not co no cooperativity in biological systems. The, the binding curves, instead of being sigmoidal, what they show is the hyperbolic uh, dependence. Well, it turns out that actually on the other hand, I'm telling you that the system is the most cooperative you can imagine, right? Because not only the motor binds four ATPs, but the motor knows that it must not hydrolyze anything until the last one has been bound, which is the ultimate form of cooperativity. And so what's going on? And it turns out that the binding of ATP is not reversible. The system will become uh, sigmoidal and will give you n greater than one if the binding of the multiple ATPs are connected through reversible steps. But you can show, and that's what I have not told you explicitly, but it's in the slide, that if every binding of ATP is separated by an, by a, by an irreversible step, which we believe is the actual commitment, the actual cocking of the ATP aces into place in order to be able to then give the power stroke, if you do that now, all the equations, which actually depend on the second power, third power of ATP, and give you the sigmoidal dependence, and n greater than one, become go to go to zero, and the only terms that are left are the linear terms of the Michaelis mentem, and n equals one. So in fact, the system is cooperative. In, in fact, but because there is this irreversible transition in between the binding of the ATP, n appears equal to one. Yes. And we've done it at very low ATP, at a very high concentration of ATP, and it, is, it remains to be true. In fact. Okay, so uh, we're yes. running a little late. Two more quick questions. Yes. 
Yes, so it does, in fact. And so, uh, again, I didn't show those slides because, uh, because of time. But now we've done an experiment where we carry out the actual packaging and we put a tiny bead on the cent in the center of the DNA, on the side, and what you can see is that as the DNA goes in, the little bead actually rotates. And by the amount of rotation, you can actually tell that what the motor is doing is actually unwinding a little bit the DNA, and it's generating torque on the DNA as it actually goes inside the head of the bacteriophage. In order to be able to actually package the coil inside the head of the bacteriophage. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, the way I often uh, uh, say it is if you, if you want to actually call your heart and goes in, into, a, into, a, into a loop, you better actually twist it as you go around, exactly. So it makes perfect sense. Biology is more, much more mechanical and physical than people have given credit to. <laughs> okay, so let's thank Carlos. <laughs> right. That's right. Okay.